Hey there, fellow knowledge seekers. Have you ever seen like a movie trailer and thought, whoa, I need to know more about this? Hmm. What? Well, that's what happened to us when we saw the trailer for Join or Die on Netflix. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And it's all about the work of Robert Putnam, this political scientist. It seems like you two are ready to take uh, a deep dive into social capital then, huh? <laughs> You've got a whole bunch of Putnam's work here from his article, like uh, The Prosperous Community, yeah. to uh, excerpts from his book Bowling Alone, and even some uh, research on two-level games. That's right. And since the movie's based on all his ideas, we thought... Why not use it as like a roadmap for this deep dive? Yeah, I like it. It's like we're getting a sneak peek into the main themes. But don't worry, no spoilers. Okay, good. But we'll definitely touch on some of the key ideas it presents. It starts with this kind of bleak picture, right? A world where everyone's just out for themselves. But then uh, it asks this really interesting question. Yeah. Like, what if there's a better way? And that's where social capital comes in. Okay. It's almost like this hidden force that makes everyone want to cooperate. But before we get ahead of ourselves, yeah. could you break down what social capital actually is for those of us who aren't, you know, philosophy or economics experts? Absolutely. Imagine two farmers, right? Okay. Each with a field of corn ready for harvest. Right. But one farmer's corn is ripe today, the other's tomorrow. It'd be way easier, way more efficient yeah. if they just helped each other out, right? Teamwork makes the dream work. Exactly. But here's the thing. Each farmer's thinking, what if I help this guy today and tomorrow he just leaves me high and dry? Oh, so that's that's the dilemma. That's it. That's the dilemma social capital tries to solve. How do we get over that fear and create a system where, you know, everyone wins by working together? So it's all about trust. Trust is a big part, yeah. yeah. Think of social capital as the glue that holds uh, a community together. It's built on networks, shared norms, and yeah, trust. The more we trust each other, the more connected we are, the more likely we are to just lend a hand. So it's like um, like a neighborhood watch program where everyone's looking out for each other. Exactly. Or even just knowing your neighbors well enough to borrow a cup of sugar. Precisely. And here's the thing. Those little acts, they have this ripple effect. Oh, really? Yeah. They create a sense of belonging. They make us feel safer. And get this. They actually lead to better schools, lower crime rates, even a more effective government. Wow. So it's not just about warm, fuzzy feelings. Mm -hmm. It has actual real world benefits. Right. That's what Putnam wanted to understand, like why some communities do so well while others struggle. Right. He started with a study in Italy comparing different regional governments. This is where uh, making democracy work comes in, right? I remember the trailer mentioned Tuscany. Yes. Putnam found that regions like Tuscany with high levels of civic engagement, they were doing way better than, say, regions like Sicily. So, like, people were more involved in choirs, clubs, even just local government. Yeah, exactly. And places like Sicily, people were less connected, less trusting. So it wasn't about how rich the region was, but how, how connected they were. And get this, it wasn't just that wealthy areas were more civic, it was the other way around. <sighs> Being civic made them more prosperous. Oh, wow. It's like they were investing in this powerful but invisible infrastructure. Okay, that's fascinating. So... Strong communities actually lead to stronger economy. It's a virtuous cycle, yeah. But here's the thing. He noticed a disturbing trend in America. Oh. Despite our image as, you know, a nation of joiners, we were starting to see this decline in social capital. Mm. And that's what led him to write Bowling Alone. The Bowling Alley, a mm. classic symbol of American social life. But if people are bowling alone, what's happening to all those connections? That's the million dollar question. He found evidence everywhere. Fewer people voting, joining clubs, attending PTA meetings, even just hanging out with their neighbors. But haven't we seen a rise in new types of groups like online communities, environmental organizations? That's a great. Could those not be signs of social capital like evolving? Mm, that's a good question, and Putnam addresses that. Okay. He acknowledges the importance of these new groups, but they're not a one-to-one -one replacement. So, like, being a member of a national environmental group doesn't have the same impact as being an active member of your local community garden. Precisely. They may be politically influential, yeah. but they often lack that that face-to-face -face interaction. Right. I mean, you might be passionate about the same cause, but you're not really connecting with others on a personal level. So even though there's a lot of activism and engagement happening online, it's not really translating into 
like the kind of social glue that holds communities together at the the local level. That's his argument. Yeah. And it's something to think about as we navigate this, you know, increasingly digital world. Yeah. Okay. So if we're buying into this idea that America is, in fact, bowling alone, the next big question is, like, why? Right. What's causing this decline? Well, that's where it gets really interesting. He explores all sorts of potential culprits. Okay. Women entering the workforce, increased mobility, suburban sprawl, even the rise of the welfare state. So people were pointing fingers at all the big changes happening. Exactly. But here's the thing. When he looked at the data. Yeah. A lot of those explanations just fell apart. Employed people were actually more civic, not less. And the decline was happening across the board, not just white flight or a backlash to the civil rights movement. So it wasn't these big social and economic shifts. What was it? Did he ever find like a, a smoking gun? Well, he did identify one major suspect, and it's probably sitting in your living room right now. Wait a minute. Don't tell me. The yeah, television. You got it. That innocent looking box in the corner. His research found a strong correlation between the rise of television and the decline of social capital, hmm. especially for that uh, long civic generation that, you know, grew up without it. Hold on. How could something as simple as watching TV have such a huge impact? That's what we're going to unpack. So before we uh, went off on that tangent, we were talking about TV. <laughs> right. It just seems so counterintuitive. Like, I mean, we've all grown up with TV. It's just it's just there. Yeah. How could it possibly be like undermining our social connections? It's a good question. So Putnam explores a few different mechanisms. The first one is pretty straightforward. It's just time displacement. Think about how much time, like collectively, we all spend watching TV. Hours, probably. Exactly, right. And that's time that could be spent uh, engaging in activities that actually, you know, build social capital. Right volunteering, going to community events, even just having dinner with friends or family. So it's not that TV is like inherently bad. It's that it's taking the place of things that could be more socially enriching. Exactly. And that was especially true for that generation. Uh, you know, that kind of came of age as television became a thing. Right. They had less time for all that that traditional kind of social interaction, right. joining clubs, civic organizations, things like that. It's interesting because the movie trailer talks about how our generation is even more plugged in. Smartphones, social media. Do you think those have had a similar impact on our social lives? That's a great question. I think researchers are still kind of grappling with that. Yeah. While those technologies definitely give us new ways to connect, mm -hmm. they also present these new challenges, right? Right. It's almost like we're constantly tethered to these devices, even when we're physically with other people. Oh, absolutely. I'm definitely guilty of that myself. Yeah. But back to television. Putnam also argues that the content itself might be playing a role as well. Like, how so? Yeah, his research suggests that people who watch a lot of TV tend to have a more cynical view of the world. Okay. They overestimate things like crime rates. They're more distrustful of others. I can see that. I mean, we see so much violence, so much conflict on TV. It's easy to start thinking the world is this, like dangerous, unfriendly place. Exactly. And that perception can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Oh, right. If you think people can't be trusted, you're less likely to, you know, reach out, build relationships, right? engage in your community. So it's not just about the time spent watching. It's also about the messages we're absorbing yeah. and how they might be like shaping our outlook. Exactly. And those messages can be really subtle. It's not like overt propaganda. Yeah. It's more about those underlying narratives, the stories that kind of emphasize individualism, competition, sometimes even fear. Right. The trailer talked about that too, like how TV makes us more passive. And that kind of ties into that whole consumerism thing they talked about. Right. So instead of participating, you know, we become spectators. We're passively consuming. And that passivity can spill over into other areas of life, makes us less likely to vote, volunteer, even just, you know, strike up a conversation with a stranger. Right. So it's like we're trading real world experiences and relationships for a uh, kind of simulated version we get through the screen. And that trade off, according to Putnam, comes at a cost, right? It weakens that social fabric. It erodes trust. It makes it harder to deal with, you know, big collective challenges. Okay. This is getting kind of depressing. Yeah. But surely Putnam doesn't just leave us with this, like, dire warning, right? Mm -hmm. 
Does he offer any solutions? He does, and that's what I like about his work. He's not just diagnosing the problem, he's yeah. looking for solutions. Oh, yeah? But before we get into that, I think we should switch gears for a bit. Okay. Talk about another really interesting part of Putnam's work. Hmm. His research on uh, international diplomacy and two-level games. Oh, yeah. The trailer hinted at that. Right. Like, something about world leaders playing chess on two boards at once. Exactly. Yeah. And this is where things get uh, pretty interesting. Okay. I'm all ears. So imagine you're a world leader. You're trying to, say, negotiate a treaty. Right. You're not just dealing with other countries, right? right. You also got to deal with your own people back home. So you're trying to make a deal that works both internationally and for, like, your own citizens. Exactly. That's the heart of two-level games. You're playing on two boards at once. That sounds incredibly complicated. It is. And Putnam gives us a way to understand it. He talks about these win sets, the possible agreements that would be acceptable to, you know, all the parties involved. So it's like finding that sweet spot where everyone wins, or at least everyone gets enough of what they want to make it worth it. Exactly. But the size of those win sets can vary a lot. Depends on the issue, the political climate, and how much public support there is. So a bigger win set means more room for compromise. In theory, yes, but it can also be a double-edged sword. How so? If you have a ton of options, it might actually weaken your bargaining position because yeah. the other side knows you're willing to concede more. Oh, so it's like a balancing act. You got to be flexible enough to get a deal, but not so flexible that you give everything away. Exactly. And Putnam really highlights how important it is to understand those domestic constraints. You got to know what's going on back home to be a good diplomat. It's not just about knowing a country's official position, but also the internal pressures, the political calculations. It's like being a detective almost, mm -hmm. trying to figure out what's even possible based on what's happening domestically. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. And that detective work can really determine whether a negotiation succeeds or fails. Okay, we've got the basics of win sets and two-level games, but can you give me like some actual examples. How does this play out in the real world? Sure. One of the most famous examples is what happened with the Versailles Treaty after World War I. Oh, the treaty that was supposed to create lasting peace but kind of backfired. Right. Putnam argues that one reason it failed was because of a miscalculation of those win sets. President Wilson, who really championed the treaty, he overestimated his ability to get it ratified in the U.S. Senate. He faced huge opposition from senators who were, you know, very isolationist, very skeptical of getting involved in international affairs. So even though the treaty might have had a lot of support internationally, and maybe even with the American public, the politics in the Senate created a really narrow win set for Wilson. Exactly. And that's what ultimately killed the treaty. It's a powerful reminder that even if everyone has good intentions, things can get derailed by domestic politics. Wow, that's... That's pretty sobering. But let's move to something a bit more recent. The trailer mentioned the Bond Summit in 1978. What happened there? Ah, uh, the Bond Summit. That's yeah. a great example of those two level games in action. The world was facing this uh, economic slowdown. Leaders were under pressure to, you know, work together to stimulate growth. The U.S., under President Carter, wanted Germany and Japan to increase their spending, basically help boost the global economy. So if those big economies are doing well, it helps everyone, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm hearing. But Germany was facing pressure at home to control inflation. Their win set for economic stimulus was much smaller than what the U.S. was hoping for. So even though they might have seen the value in global cooperation, their domestic politics were, like, holding them back. Exactly. And what's interesting is that Putin's research suggests that the final agreement at Bonn, it wasn't really driven by international pressure. It was more about Chancellor Schmidt's domestic calculations. So he was playing that two-level game, trying to find a solution that would work both internationally and domestically. Exactly. He had elections coming up, and there was this growing pressure within his own party to do something to stimulate the economy. So by agreeing to like a small stimulus package at the summit, he could appease those critics back home while also looking like a team player on the world stage. You got it. It perfectly illustrates how domestic politics can really shape international negotiations. This is really making me rethink how I view international relations. It's not just about countries interacting. It's about these complex webs of like domestic and international pressures all pushing and pulling. Right. And that's what makes Putnam's two-level game framework so valuable. It helps us see beyond the surface. Yeah. This reminds me of something else the trailer mentioned. Involuntary defection. What does that mean in this context? 
oh, that's important. Sometimes leaders really do want to uphold an agreement. They just can't because of those domestic constraints. So it's not necessarily bad faith. It's just reflection of like the political realities they face back home. Exactly. It could be that the leader personally believes in the agreement, but can't get their parliament to ratify it or they face a public backlash. Right. That's where the size of those wind sets is so important. Yeah. If the wind set is too small, yeah. the risk of involuntary defection goes way up. So it's not just about negotiating a good deal. It's also about making sure you can actually implement it back home. Exactly. It often involves getting stakeholders on board, educating the public, building those coalitions. Almost like a two-pronged marketing campaign. You yeah. sell the deal internationally and domestically perfect analogy it highlights how diplomacy is about communication and persuasion just as much as it is about you know the actual deal making hmm. this all kind of circles back to social capital doesn't it if people trust their leaders and understand why international cooperation is important that creates a much bigger win set right absolutely a society with high social capital is much more likely to be you know outward looking because people are more likely to trust other countries. Yeah. More willing to compromise, more likely to see those benefits of, like, global engagement. Exactly. That's why Putnam's work is so relevant, especially today, as we're dealing with, you know, climate change, economic instability. The ability to cooperate is essential. So it's not just about building strong communities. It's also about creating a foundation for, like, a more cooperative, peaceful world. That's a really good point. But before we uh, get too carried away, let's bring it back down to the individual. Remember, the trailer for Join or Die emphasizes that personal connection. Right. They talk about how joining groups that bridge divides, you know, connecting with people from different backgrounds can be especially powerful. That's huge. It's not just about hanging out with people who are just like us. We need to be looking for connections with people who, you know, challenge us, broaden our horizons. Yeah, it's how we break down stereotypes, build empathy, create a more inclusive society. Exactly. Putnam's research actually shows that those kinds of bridging connections, they're essential for fostering tolerance, reducing prejudice. So it's not just about how many connections we have, but also like the quality and diversity of those connections. I like that. It's like diversifying your, your social portfolio. I love that. So we've explored Putnam's work on the decline of social capital in America, his insights on two-level games, the importance of bridging connections. But we got to circle back to one of his most controversial arguments. That TV is a major culprit in this whole social capital decline. Oh, yeah. That's one that'll definitely get people talking, ready to delve into that. Oh. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's unpack his argument and see if we can separate fact from fiction. <laughs> okay. So let's talk television. I have to admit, this whole idea that TV is a major culprit in the decline of social capital is... Uh, it's a lot to process. Like, is Putnam really saying our screams are to blame for all our problems? Well, he lays out a pretty strong argument. Remember we were talking about the, uh, that long civic generation, yeah. the ones who grew up without TV? Mm. His research shows a big difference in their levels of civic engagement. Mm. And as TV became more and more common, those indicators of social capital, they started to drop. So it's like two different worlds almost, huh? Yeah. One where people were super involved in their communities. Yeah. And then another where everyone's glued to the TV screen. Right. And while correlation doesn't equal causation, Putnam says the timing is just too perfect to ignore. Okay. The rise of television really seems to have played a role in this shift away from, you know, traditional ways of being social. Okay. I'm starting to see the connection here. Yeah. But how does he explain this link? Like, how does TV actually lead to less social capital? He's got a few ideas, but the simplest one is just time displacement. Okay. Every hour you spend watching TV yeah. is an hour you're not spending with other people, volunteering, doing things that, uh, you know, actually build those social connections. Right, right. It's that classic image of the family just sitting there in silence, yeah. staring at the TV. Yeah, exactly. Maybe a bit exaggerated, mm. but it gets at something real. Uh. TV, especially in its more passive forms, it can really suck up a lot of our free time. Right. Time that we could be using to you know, build those relationships. But couldn't you argue that watching TV together can be a social experience, like family movie night or uh -huh. watching a game with friends? Oh, for sure. Those shared experiences can definitely be good for bonding. Right. But Putnam's research suggests that overall, TV tends to isolate more than it connects. Mm. He points to the rise of, you know, multiple TV sets and homes. 
Right. So instead of everyone gathered around one TV, yeah. we're all off in our own little worlds watching our own shows. Exactly. And that makes it harder to, you know, have those shared moments instead of talking, reacting together, yeah. building connections through that shared experience. We're just kind of off in our own little bubbles. Right. Yeah. OK, so that's the time issue. Yeah. But Putnam also says that the content of TV itself might be a problem. Right. He talks about all these studies that show a link between watching a lot of TV and having a more uh, cynical view of the world, you know? Yeah. Like, more distrusting, more negative. Think about the stuff we see all the time. Crime shows, news full of conflict, reality TV that focuses on the worst in people. That's true. It's a constant barrage of negativity. It's yeah. easy to start thinking the whole world is like that. Exactly. And that belief even if it's not true, can become a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Oh, right? If you think everyone's out to get you, you're not going to reach out, you're not going to build those relationships. So it's not just about how much TV we watch, but also what we're watching and how it might be influencing our view of the world. Precisely. And those messages can be sneaky. It's not like they're trying to brainwash us or anything. Right. But those underlying stories, they often emphasize things like individualism, competition, fear. That makes a lot of sense. But couldn't you say that TV can also expose us to, you know, different cultures, different ideas? Oh, absolutely. TV can be great for learning and understanding other perspectives. Yeah. Putnam's concern is that, you know, especially with those passive forms of TV watching, those benefits might be outweighed by the downsides. So it's not about, like, throwing out the TV altogether. It's about being aware of how much we're watching. Yeah. And maybe being a bit more picky about what we choose to watch. I think that's a great point. And, yeah. you know, maybe even just turning off the TV sometimes and uh, and actually going out and experiencing the real world. Absolutely. And that's yeah. especially important today, right? Yeah. With all the streaming, social media, all that stuff, it's almost like we need a, a social media detox or something. Yeah, a digital detox for our social lives. We're so used to these, like, passive yeah, yeah, forms yeah. of entertainment, we've forgotten how important it is to connect with people, you know, in real life. Exactly. And that's why Putnam's work is so valuable. He makes us think about how technology is impacting our lives and how we can use it in a way that actually strengthens our connections, not weakens them. So, okay. What can we do about this? If we're worried about this decline in social capital, where do we even begin? Well, Putnam has a lot of ideas. He talks about things we can do as individual and things we can do as a society. Individually, it's about making a conscious effort to connect with others. Putting down the phone, turning off the TV, actually engaging with people, right? Exactly. Make time for face-to-face -face conversations. Yeah. Join local organizations, volunteer, even just be more present in our... Uh, in our existing relationships, it's about choosing experiences, not just consumption. All right, like we need to rediscover the art of conversation, actually yeah. being present with each other. Well said. And as for society, Putnam talks about, you know, policies that could help. Okay. Investing in public spaces, supporting community organizations, creating opportunities for people to connect. It's about recognizing that social capital is just as important as, you know, roads and bridges. Like we need a, a, a new deal for social capital. I like that. A new deal for social capital. Yeah. And it's not just about longing for the past, you know. It's about recognizing that human connection matters and finding new ways to make it happen in today's world. That reminds me, we should definitely mention the movie again. Oh yeah, Join or Die. Join or Die, it <laughs> seems like the perfect companion to this whole discussion. For sure. It really gets into a lot of the stuff we've been talking about, the power of social capital, mm -hmm. the challenges of a disconnected world, and how important it is to rebuild those connections. So if you're interested in learning more about Putnam's work, definitely check out Join or Die. On Netflix. It's really thought provoking and easy to understand. Yeah. Might even inspire you to get out there and start building some of your own social capital. Couldn't agree more. And that's the big takeaway here, right? Social capital is something we can all create. Yeah. In our own lives, in our communities. Absolutely. It's about the choices we make, the relationships we invest in, and recognizing that, you know, how connected we are really impacts how happy and healthy we are, both individually and as a society. Well said. As you go about your day to day, think about those places where you really feel that sense of community, what makes them special, and how can you create more of those spaces? That's a great question. And if you enjoyed this deep dive, be sure to like and subscribe to Arcane Intelligence for more. Until next time, fellow knowledge seekers, keep those brains buzzing and those connections growing.